apps, that kind of thing. So it feels good, and then they can use their mm -hmm. smartphone to open the doors and the turn other, the heat on. Yeah, the other item too is is closeness to amenities. You know, get out of your car and walk to. Uh, get coffee or get a bite to eat or down to the library or whatever amenities are there but walking distance is one of the things that appeals and uh, to folks looking at that type of property is is you know location relative to what you can do on foot yeah so that's number of rooms is not what they're looking for there's a need for that but not in the downtown market it's smaller footprint um, so now we're going to talk about the commercial side. We just talk about the residential a little bit. There's the vacancy rate's a little higher on that. I mean, you can just see, you know, we have the old Village Plaza out here where, where Dean Health Care was. That's still got some vacancy there. Um, the uh, old Menards is pretty filled up, and there's some hotels coming. That's going to be a nice little development there. But retail is still bringing your biggest bang for your buck, if you will. Um, and the location is key to that though. If you look at Janesville Mall and it's vacancy, you know, we, again, it's rumored that uh, Boston Store is gonna be leaving. Um, they still haven't been able to fill all of Penny's space. So, but yet just down the road, we've got a new strip mall going with Mob Pizza in it, um, right in front of uh, where Festival Foods is. There's gonna be another little strip center going next to where, um, five guys and that kind of thing is. And the rent they are bringing there is crazy money. Um, but yet, further down Milton Avenue, it gets vacant and you can't. And so it's, it's just interesting with that. Um, and of course, retail's got its highest risk just because of the world we live in with the internet. Uh, these retailers come and go. Uh, so that's, they could leave. Um, our office space, we have a lot of office space, but nobody's taken the opportunity to upgrade it and make it really nice stuff. Anybody who's done that fills their space pretty quickly. So again, people are looking for nice, finished, um, just quality office space. Um, so if that's something you want to look at, that's, that's another opportunity. Mm -hmm. so. And then downtown. Um, Question on that. Yep. What are the sizes of the office spaces? Like office spaces like this or bigger <laughs> office spaces? For so in Janesville, it would be like this. Um, you know, maybe you're going to this, Dave, but um, we don't have a lot of big office spaces. Office spaces. Like office um, spaces. The, the Prospect Building downtown. So Ryan Medical took, I think it's two floors of, but they did uh, an extensive, the building was probably built in the late 60s, early 70s, and they did a, a massive remodel of of the building three four years ago, right. um, and so that was you know that's a, Shine is a company that wants to attract you know these are professional folks from out of the area, and so having space that is appealing and functional and, and feels modern is important. And there, to your point, there's limited space like that. If you go downtown, there's a lot of buildings that could be that space, but not everyone stepped forward to do it, and so um, you know for for folks to have someone that's willing to sign a long term lease that demonstrates the ability to, to, to get to the end of it, there, there's, a there's opportunity. It's just finding who those folks are that, you know, they need X number of square feet, have deep enough pockets to sign a long-term lease and, and give you some confidence going into it that, you know, this is going to cash flow um, to make that investment up front. Yeah. So the Parker Building, I don't know if you're familiar with that, is downtown Janesville. It's our tallest building in town, but that has bigger space and it also smaller space. They're really flexible on what they can do with that. But um, again, they just haven't dressed it up a lot to do that. Um, the biggest lookers right now are probably for between 500 and 2,000, probably about what you're looking at. Um, yeah, now let's talk a little bit about active versus passive investments. And again, some of this might be very fundamental for all of you, but we'll discuss it anyways. Active is an investment that does not make money unless you do something for it. Um, it's not working unless you're working it. Um, some examples of that are your job. And yes, I call your job an investment because the most important thing I think I have is my time. So wherever I'm spending my time, you know, that's an investment. So I consider your job an investment. Flipping houses, to me, that's, that's an active 
investment because you have to get it in its position to go ahead and sell. You know, you're going to get that ready to go. And then day trading is another example of active investment where you can't day trade if you're not doing it during the day, right? So it's, you have to be the one doing it. So that's kind of, kind of that. Anything else on that, Dave? Um, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about kind of further in where we've kind of alternate some slides, but, um, you know, as the bank looks at it, when you come in, you know, you've got kind of an idea or a property in mind. Um, you know, we like to see some balance there, you know, that here's what I already do, and I'm looking to, you know, add this into my portfolio, just like you would investing in a mutual fund or something like that, where you have the opportunity to say, you know, I've got my tra traditional cash flow through whatever source it is, but this is going to supplement it. And so I understand it's going to take an investment on my part as the borrower up front, but I've got the tools put together to go ahead and have this supplement what I'm doing. And you know, depending on what level you want to be involved in it, either use that as a, an opportunity to grow it over time or just simply treat it as a one and done and say, hey, we net something positive out of this each month. And so um, you know, that's one of the things as you sit down with a bank or our bank or whatever bank that you know, that will be talked about is you know, how, how does this fit into the overall grand scheme of what cash flow you're able to generate globally in, in what you do? Um, <clears throat> passive investment, it takes money while you sleep. Um, you invest the money, then you wait for the return to happen. Um, and again, when I talk about jobs, I, there are people who quit their jobs so they can become real estate investors. Well, then you're just changing jobs. You didn't quit your job, you switched your job. So I, I always, you know, I go to these RIAs and other investment seminars and everybody's talking about quit your job and invest in real estate and then I'll talk to people who do that and a few years later they're like, yeah, that's a lot more work than what I ever had when I had my job. So there's a balance like Dave was talking about when you're, when you're making that decision because if you decide you're going to be a full-time real estate investor, guess what? That's your job. So as we get into this, um, mutual funds, REITs, um, our IRAs, 401ks, real estate, and then other opportunities to invest, um, you can invest in people who are flipping houses. You know, so you can be their bank, you can invest in them. You can invest in groups that are investing in real estate together. Um, it's called crowdfunding is what the fancy name for it is now. Um, you, know, you can invest in these things where people are doing the work for you and you're gonna get a return on your investment. So, A REIT is a real estate investment trust. So what that, where that's a little bit different is that's something you can buy on the stock markets, on the stock exchange, and their full purpose is they invest in real estate only. So it's essentially a mutual fund, but instead of investing in stocks, they're investing in properties, and then some professional, essentially almost like a mutual fund manager, runs that operation, and then the profits or the losses are harvested and shared with the people who own the shares in the REIT. Yeah, so <clears> it's <throat> it's... Wall Street's version of investing in real estate. Um, if we have some time privately, I'll give you my opinion on it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want that on air. Um, so there's ways to invest in real estate, and this is what we're going to talk about now. There's the traditional way, cash, right? It still is king. You can walk in, as FDR says, pay for it in full. That's really your safest way of investing in real estate. Um, Lender financing, and Dave, I'll let you talk a little bit about this, but, and I'm talking traditional lender where you walk in, you have 20 to 25% down of what the purchase price is, um, and they'll give you 75 to 80%. That's where I say the power of real estate is. Um, Dave, I'll let you can just mm -hmm. touch a little more on. on yeah, we'll talk about rate of return and, and some other things um, here a little bit later, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit different than a traditional mortgage market, but again, we'll cover that here shortly. Yeah, and then the other thing is land contract or, and seller financing. So, you know, you may not have the ability to get with the bank or whatever, and, and but you still want the deal, and you get a land contract. So the seller is going to finance the deal for you in some way, shape, or form. Um, those are the traditional ways of investing in real estate. Um, things that have started to happen and that are becoming a little bit more, uh, I guess, in the non-traditional world, is you can use your IRA or your 401k to purchase real estate right inside of it. 
So you're not pulling the money out of your 401k or your IRA. You're actually investing inside of it and purchasing real estate with that. I'm going to do a seminar about that in a couple of months, a little bit different one. It goes more into detail on that. But you can, you can use that and, and borrow, and, and you can do that. And you can actually even get lender financing. They don't like it very much, but so that means you have to put a lot more down. Mm -hmm. But there are ways to even leverage that, and there's a lot of really interesting things to do right outside, right inside of your IRA or 401k, um, which is, I think, great. Um, thing about is called crowdfunding, um, and this has been around for a really long time. But a few years ago, they put a name to it and put some legal uh, stuff behind it, and, and just allowed it. And crowdfunding is like I was explaining, maybe Dave has a bunch of real estate that he is actively going after and may flip or buy and hold. And he's looking for investors to come in and then you get a return on that. And there's all of you chip in a little bit of money and Dave goes out and finds those deals and puts them together. Um, that's a basic way of talking about crowdfunding. And we have some opportunities here to do things of that nature, but, um, you know, the, the nice thing about crowdfunding is it's usually a low entry point, not a lot of cash out front. Um, and, but you gotta, the project has to make sense to you. It has to, we're gonna talk about, you have to have a goal of what you wanna do with real estate. And so you need to know that it's part of what you wanna do if you're gonna invest in a crowd. Any questions? Okay, now we're gonna talk about what I what I like about real estate and why I think it's a really great investment opportunity. Leverage. And this my lender friend gets a little nervous when I start talking about these things because leverage can be really scary and then the bank doesn't like what happens in the end sometimes. So um, but if you take twenty five thousand dollars and invest it in real estate, and you take twenty five thousand dollars and invest it in a mutual fund. There's a difference if you use leverage over 30 years. Now, this doesn't mean there's, there's a safe way of doing it and not a safe way. Basically, this is saying every five years, you're gonna take the equity that you have, you're gonna reinvest that equity again. So you're gonna stay in the same leverage position. That makes sense. So you're not gonna, the lender's gonna be in the same risk position. You're not gonna go 100% any of your properties. Okay, you're going to stay in what I would call a healthy leverage position. You're, but you're gonna take the equity and you're gonna go do it again. And what we're assuming though with this number is a 5% um, appreciation increase in real estate per year and a 5% return in the mutual fund. Um, go ahead, Dave. Give your opinion on that. <laughs> so, so what I would tell you is this: um, we work with folks who who invest in, in this philosophy as well. And, and what I would tell you is this: um, to to stay at that levered position, there's a couple things that the bank's going to want to do. Um, you know, a bank can be skeptical of created uh, appreciation. You know, if it's a simply I bought it, held it for 24 months, and it went magically from 200,000 to 300,000, well, why did that happen? Well, we remodeled it, we made improvements to it, and as a result, the, the, the market rent for that property has gone up. Okay, that is reasonable um, versus the, you know, I just, I'm a smarter than the guy who was selling it, and so by my doing this, I was able to go ahead and just recognize value that that person didn't do. That certainly can happen, and it does happen from time to time, um, but, you know, getting a pop property appraised is, is, in many cases, will reveal um, you know, what, what is the basis of that? And so created equity either through we've amortized the debt and paid it down or we've made investments in the property that have made it more desirable to the market and therefore pull higher rents. That type of, of appreciation certainly we would recognize. The other thing I would tell you is if you're looking at a single family property or, or let's say a duplex, the way that the value of those is determined is very different than when you start getting into 18, eight units or 16 units or something like that. And so on those smaller properties, if someone's gonna look at it, they're really gonna look at it from what we would call a sales comparison approach, where just simply what's out on the market, you know, on a kind of a per square foot basis almost. When you get into these larger properties, an appraiser is gonna say, you know, that's all well and good and we wanna see they have a quality piece of real estate, but the income approach is something they're gonna use to really weigh the value of it. And what they're gonna say basically is, 
is you, the present value of your cash investment is going to generate future cash flows of X. And so, you know, doing the what leases do you have signed? How much are they drawing? And, you know, how are the utilities handling things like that? That's going to play a much greater role in what is the, the value of that property. So, like I said, eight units seems to be kind of the place where uh, an appraiser is really going to start focusing on the income stream that it generates just simply or beyond simply what the value of the sticks and bricks are. And so, as you look at properties, or if you're looking at properties, just know as you kind of go through, we have an example later, you know, what is this really worth and how am I building equity? The, the, the definition of what that is changes as the properties change as well. Yeah, and I think, so a, a few things that he hit on there. Anything single family to a four unit is definitely gonna fall into that, what's the value, and they don't look as much at the income on it. Commercial, so that could be a single tenant, or really six to you know eight plus. It's the four, five, 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 five and six if you get a little the transitional yeah. stage. Right, mm -hmm. but the commercial property again. Can, remember, a commercial property can be a single <coughs> tenant, so that would still be the situation. But if you're going to play the leverage game, don't play it based on appreciation. Play it based on how your property is cash flowing. Use your cash flow on it. Don't, don't play the appreciation game with it. Truly, truly use cash flow. That's what is going to make your lender happy, and that's what's going to make this work for you because you're, you have rent coming in, they're paying for it, that kind of thing. Playing the appreciation game solely is gonna come back to bite you. Um, before 2008, people didn't believe that because mm -hmm. we always had this, yeah. this thing. You, you would have a little bit of dip, but it would always go up. 2008 taught people, a lot of people a lot of lessons. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just what you want to, that's again, buy on cash flow. Don't, don't buy on appreciation. I just like that slide. My uh, friends who work at Baird and other investment firms hate this slide, but that's why I like to have it. <laughs> um, any questions right now on anything we've talked about or anything? Anybody want to take a break? Are we okay? We good? Okay, moving on. Fix and flips, buy and holds. So we're gonna talk buy and holds first. I like buy and holds. Um, that's where you build your wealth. You know, that's, it's when Carnegie and FDR were talking about investing in real estate, they were talking buy and holds. Um, it's a long-term investment though. It's not like what we'd see on TV, you know, where you're gonna be rich overnight. It is, it is a long-term investment. So again, we talk about your job, you keep your job, and then when you retire, not only do you have whatever you had from your job, but you have all of a sudden this wealth that if you just keep your eyes closed and let that thing build, all of a sudden you've got a lot of money that you didn't realize you had. So again, it's long term, um, and it's not a get rich quick thing. It's, you're in it for the long haul. Again, I'm gonna get on my soapbox of buying based on cash flow, not on appreciation. Um, if you, as a real estate investor, say, okay, I'm only gonna purchase based on cash flow, it will be very difficult for you to lose. If you, again, buy healthy and stay healthy, but if you buy based on cash flow, it would be very difficult to lose. Um, have a plan and stick with your plan. And, and what I mean by that is if you have a plan of reinvesting every five years, reinvest every five years. Um, don't go off of your, this is what my goal is. Now that doesn't mean that your plan start out as I'm only gonna own single family homes and then when a good deal on a duplex comes up, you don't buy it or a commercial, but have a strategy of, if I'm gonna buy this investment, this is the rate of return I wanna get on it, this is the cash flow I wanna get on it, and then you can go buy that property and you can you know, have, do an educated, uh, wow, I'm having a hard time talking right now. Educated, Way of looking at it. Yeah, approaching. And like I said, we'll have an example here. We'll have an example here. Talks a little bit about, you know, if, if I'm looking at a property or I'm looking at multiple properties, how do I weigh which one is better? Because you're never going to have the opportunity where I have two properties that are the exact same price and all the other variables are the same. I just have to pick which one 
is more comfortable for me. It's going to be one cost this and one cost this, and this is how the leases work in them and, and the rental history, and they're going to be apples to oranges comparisons that you're going to have to somehow go through and say which one of these is a better investment overall. Um, like I said, we touched that a, a bit later, but to Ron's point, it is you know what kind of cash flow can I generate? What what is it? What inputs does it require on my part from the, the get go? And and balancing those things to see you know is this a good fit? Is this a good use of my my resources? And if you have a strategy in place, you can buy quickly because you know exactly how you're going to vet a property. Um, this is going to sound like a commercial right now, and kind of is, but it's the truth too. Find a realtor and a lender who are part of your plan. Because if you have a, a realtor and lender who are on your team who are out there figuring it out for you, they're gonna find the deals because while you're out there talking with people, you're not gonna have the amount of contact that they are with people who are in this business. And your lender is gonna have people coming and talking to him about properties they wanna get rid of and that they're done with. Um, the realtors are out there looking for deals. Not all realtors and lenders are the same. so. Make sure, I mean, I would go through a few and make sure that they are following what your plan is and fit into your plan. Mm -hmm. So the fix and flips, um, again, can be a really good strategy, but just know what you're getting into with them. Um, it's, you gotta move quickly, because what can kill you on fix and flips is holding costs. I'm sitting on one right now that <laughs> sat for too long, and so, even in a great market, if you can't find the contractors to go do the work or, you know, because they're all busy, and then all of a sudden you sat on it too long, and now what happens? So um, you got to fix them fast, you got to sell them fast. That's where the upside is on the fix and flips. Again, it's very much market driven. Um, we're coming out of a market where we're in a recession. And so, you know, anything that was bought in 2009, 2010, 11, 12, any of those properties, pretty easy to make money on. So we have all these TV shows and all this stuff on experts who know how to make a lot of money flipping houses. Well, they never did it prior to 2009 or 2008 when prices were high. So we're getting back to that point where our prices are above and beyond what they were at that time. And so if you're gonna fix and flip, it's still possible and you can still make money on it, but you better know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and with that, that, that uh, and I don't speak specifically for my bank, but for our industry, if you're strictly in the business of wanting to, to flip houses, um, to Ron's point of you know having cemented relationships in advance, because A, just from a bank standpoint, it, it's hard for that to, to be a profit center for a bank, quite honestly, because it's a very, very short-term loan. Uh, the other part with it is, is there's a lot of risk in that, and so building your resume, uh, you know, why are you qualified to do this? And, and being able to say, I can qualify to do this because, and then having that, that part worked out. Um, and, and then the other item is, and we'll talk about you know, leverage and things like that also is, you know, what other assets are out there to back this up? Because you know, generally, a, a house that you just bought and then tear apart is less valuable than when you bought it in most cases. Now when you finish it, that's another, another point, but you're, you're asking a bank to enter into a transaction where I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna tear this thing apart and the thing that I bought is gonna be go from a value of here to here in a short period of time. And, and ideally it comes back here, but to the 2008, 2009 story, that happens most of the time, but it doesn't happen all the time. And so, you know, the reason we can do this is because I have a resume that says I, I can demonstrate that I know how to do these things. But the other thing is I have other assets that I can fall back. So if we have a hiccup and things sit too long or whatever the case may be, is, is there, there's a very, very well thought out plan B that'll make things work out in the end. Having a plan with fix and flips is even more important than buy and holds. Because um, you might need multiple exit strategies with a fix and flip, and you can do those. I mean, a great exit strategy on a, flip and, on a fix and flip is called rent to own. Um, and you know, those are great, especially now, um, I'm gonna give you a stat here, it's my stat of the week, but um, millennials, right, we've been riding them for a long time about they're not, buying houses and they're waiting too long or whatever. And now they are um, the number one buying group of all real estate. They just became the top group. But the reason they held back, and this is my stat of the week, is um, from 2000 to 2017, wages have increased 1%. Value of real estate from that time has gone up 32%. So 
while we're we're sitting here saying these people are lazy and not wanting to buy homes or anything else, that really doesn't have doesn't tell the story. The story is they can't afford to come buy houses. They can't, you know, they they have paid the other stat is they've paid a hundred and ten thousand dollars in rent over in the eight years. You take the generation before them and it's Twenty thousand less than that, or that time frame, you, and you as you go down, it is lower and lower, right? So the affordability was there for the older generations, while these guys they can't afford to go buy houses because student loans and their wages alone aren't going to cover what the cost of these homes are. So to get back to the point of my story here, rent to own is a great option for them. Um, you get a little bit of down payment from them and then they rent it for you from you and then you have a determined price that they can buy it out at over a period of time usually it's three years um, so just another thing on your you know, the problem with that is you're not going to get your cash out of that house you put in if you're doing a fix and flip right so you're going to have to figure out how to do that and that's when you talk with your friendly lender and say here's why you should give me a little more money uh, we'll hold off on this and we'll go into your stuff um, all right. Sure. Here. Where am I pointing? Uh, Vance? It, it'll just push you. Go. It's amazing. I don't know where it's at. Okay. So, so when Ron and I first spoke, um, his idea was, you know, have something that's kind of, you know, banking 101. If someone comes in and talks to you about, hey, I would like to buy an investment property, what are some of the things that you or someone in your role would ask, um, and give some people that might be in the audience the opportunity to kind of, you know, do their homework and, and think about what those answers to those questions might be. And so um, this is kind of high level, it's kind of 101, and so if there's like more specific questions, we'll certainly try to, I'll be happy to try to answer them for you. But again, entered into this with kind of an investor 101, and you know, what, what's my bank gonna ask me if I, if I sit down and say, hey, I've got an idea and I'd like to talk about it. <laughs> Oops, other way, other way. Very good, so things to consider, and, and this is important, and is, the answer is, is this for you? And so what I mean by that, you know, right now, I assume most of the people in the audience kind of have the traditional nine to five job. They know when they have to get there, they know when they have to leave, and they know what's expected of them. Um, as the owner of investment property, what's expected of you is whatever happens to come up. And so it, to define as, the, you know, these, these are my 10 tasks as, as an investment property owner is different. And so, you know, are you okay with getting calls for service in the middle of the night? Th these are things that you gotta think about because again, um, they're gonna happen, things will break. Um, likewise, are you handy and do you like to fix things? Because the answer is yes. Do you have time? I know I recently spoke with someone who loves fixing things and, and is good at it, but it came down to this person works like 50 hours a week. So, you know, may, maybe they can, maybe that's okay. Maybe it's like, you know, I just don't simply have time to do this even though I, I can. And so do I have a, a partner in this, in this endeavor that can kind of handle the stuff that I can't or or, or do I look at having, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, some professional management where I'm simply providing the capital and I have a professional manager who takes care of those types of things for me. Um, do I like to deal with people? Again, we're talking about rental properties, but really what you're talking about is people. You're providing a service to people. They need a place to live. And so ultimately you're providing a roof and hopefully a comfortable place for them to be. But do you like to deal with people? Because people don't always pay the rent on time or they may have unreasonable requests or they may swear to you they don't have a dog inside even though you know there's 10 of them inside. Do you like to deal with people is an important thing to consider. And then lastly, can you run a business? Your accountant's gonna ask you the same question. You know, I can fix it up, I can make it look nice, but again, can I collect the rent? Can I deal with security deposits? Can I, can I handle the fact that stuff's going to break and do I have a plan for it? Running a business is a little bit different a question than can I, can I fix up a property and present it to the marketplace. Um, the other thing to consider, going back to kind of your, your financial situation, a big one, do I have a reasonable level of outside debt? If, if you are, Ron's comment, you know, boy, I just got out of college, I've got a ton of student loans, I'm just getting my feet under me, I've got a lot of other debt, that may or may not be the proper time to come in and say, hey, bank, can I borrow some money? Well, the reason being, going back to what if 2008 happens again? What if 2009 happens again? There's the, you know, what is plan B? And if you're in a situation where you're highly leveraged already, that doesn't mean you can't work with that, but it means it might be harder to work through if what if there's a hiccup? And so either I don't have that situation because I built my balance sheet for that, or 
I do, however, plan B is in place because, in, in defining whatever that might be, um, student loans, that's a big one. Uh, in, in Tehran's point, you know, it's not uncommon for people to have thirty to fifty thousand dollars of student loans. How are you going to pay that back? Uh, I, I feel fortunate I don't have that problem, but a lot of people do. And, and it's like, how, how do you deal with that? And you don't have an asset to fall back on other than the, the value of your education from a lending standpoint. Uh, the mortgage on your existing residence, talking about if there is a, you know, we're, we're doing some remodeling and there's a hiccup of some kind, if you have equity in another property or, or your home, that can be levered if need be potentially to create what you need to get the property and the, the property you're looking at in the working order you want it to be. Medical bills, um, this, is, this is one of the, I think, the tragedies of our age. The cost of going to the doctor is, is crazy. And so people, unfortunately, who maybe have great cash flow and great other things will have medical bills that will go out there and wreck their credit. And so I, I can tell you, and this isn't a credit fixing uh, presentation, but most medical providers will work with you if you make up a payment plan on these things. But again, those things show up on your credit and can be detrimental to putting together the numbers for uh, a property on invest or a loan on investment property. And then lastly, credit card balances. What, what I would tell you is, is, is unsecured debt is viewed differently than secured debt. Secured debt, let's say you have a house and, and it's a $200,000 house and you have a $100,000 mortgage. That means you've built up value through the repayment of things or the improvement of things. Unsecured debt doesn't have that asset behind it that offsets it. And so saying, you know, I'll run up my credit cards to do X, Y, Z is viewed a little differently than it then I will extract equity that I've created in other things because I'm just converting one asset into cash. So it's an asset to an asset. And so that's another one I would advise you to really think about as you uh, try to get your uh, financial house in order for that. Another thing, um, I know if I talk to folks who are trying to get into, you know what, I want to go out and buy a duplex. And uh, people will oftentimes kind of just generically think, you know, I, I want to, like to get a 30 year fixed loan. I got 5% down that I can put on it. Let's get this thing going. Um, the difference is, is in the investment property world, it's, just, it's, it's a different animal. Um, and so one of the things you're going to look at is um, conventional mortgages, they're, they're, they're higher risk. And what I always tell people who ask, well, what do you mean? I said, if I lost my job and I had enough money to pay one of my bills, what's the bill I'm going to pay? My rent or my house payment? What's, what's the thing that I will let go first? Things that I don't need, that I want, but I don't need. So, you know, if it comes down to paying the payment on my rental property or paying the payment on the house that I live in, people generally, and, and I understand why, will say, you know what, the rental property is going to have to get skipped. And so those are generally considered higher risk. Um, loan terms. Getting a fixed rate loan isn't possible. If it's a one to four family in your name, there's secondary pro market products for that. Again, you generally need more equity to do that. There's usually more cost, again, because it's higher risk, more closing costs, things like that. Or if you're in a kind of a traditional commercial bank you know, type of investment property, you have an LLC or something like that, which is very, very common, um, you're usually looking at a fixed rate for three to five years and repayment over 20 years or less, typically. And as Ron said at the very beginning of our pro presentation, I generally don't talk in absolutes of this is the ceiling, this is the floor, this is the high, this is the low, because it depends on every situation. But this is kind of generically what you'd be thinking about. Um, and then lastly, and, and we touched upon it a little bit already, is there's more down payment. Again, this goes back to risk. One of the nice things about purchasing a, a resident, the house that you will live in, is there's a thing called private mortgage insurance available. And so it allows you to buy a house with less than 20% down. You don't have that opportunity on investment property. Um, and I can go into why that is. If anyone's curious, I'll explain the, the, the reasoning for that. But basically what it means is you're looking at 20 to 25% down is usually a, a minimum as opposed to 5% down like on a traditional home mortgage. Was there a question on that? Otherwise, I'll continue on. Well, just to touch on a couple of things. <clears throat> um, when you decide to become a real estate investor or be in this, um, you're going to have the dilemma you're going to have to face is do I want to keep this in my personal name? Or do I want to put this in a company name? Um, and the advantages to keep it in your personal name is then you can get this 30 year fixed financing on one to four family units for, what is it, four? I think, it's, I think it's eight properties. Okay, eight properties. I think, don't quote me We're on that. Go, you're held to that now. <laughs> um, so it's a certain number of properties that you can put in your personal name and you can get 30 year fixed financing on it. Um, and again, you probably have to put 20% down, but that's a nice note to have. Mm -hmm. Downside of that is um, someone decides to sue you from that property, they can sue you personally and take everything you have. If you put it in the company name, an LLC, uh, which is the 
way most people are doing it, then all they can do is come after the LLC. Um, my recommendation as you're doing LLCs is once you get a million dollars of assets in the LLC, it's time to open LLC number two. And so we're just kind of, th those are just things that we talk about, um, again, depending on what your situation, yeah. With, with an LLC, uh, you can't um, do a fixed mortgage then is what you're saying because you're not putting it in your name? Correct. So that's the downfall. Yeah, you'll mortgage. still probably have to personally guarantee that note mm -hmm. at the bank um, unless your LLC has a ton of assets. Mm -hmm. Um, you're probably going to have to personally guarantee it. Again, that's where it goes individually. Mm -hmm. But you're protected from being sued right. and other things. But yeah, that's where they. That's why they won't do that. And, and the primary driver of that is there's a secondary market for fixed rate loans, and so there is a certain round hole that square pegs don't fit in for that. So what they want to be able to do in, in that marketplace is, is take that debt and package it with other loans just like it and sell it to investors. And so for that to happen, there has to be just certain parameters that just don't get crossed. And one of them is it's owned by people and not by entities. Um, so will they change that someday? Perhaps I've seen it come up as, you know, hey, we're thinking about stuff, but I, I, and I'm not an expert on that particular industry. But generally speaking, because uh, an LLC doesn't fit that is you're looking at bank terms. Remember, banks fund their loans through their depositors. And so, you know, until we start getting people to sign up for 30 year CDs, and, and 30 year checking accounts, it's hard to fund loans for 30 years and, and make any kind of a rate commitment for that period of time. And so, so that's where you see the difference between the, the quote unquote business side of lending and, and the more residential side. Do you think it would be, it'd be better if, like, if you wanted to put in your name and had a fixed mortgage on it, the money it would cost to possibly like get a balloon insurance policy to cover any kind of suing? Um, what I would tell you is this. First of all, I can't give you any legal advice. You know, However, I what, what, I will, what I will tell you is if it were me, um, if, if it were me, I like the security of knowing that I'm once removed from it, even though I'm still the captain of the ship, that the ship is another's name and, and gives me at least a barrier of, of protection. The other part is, is that, um, you know, some people do hold a property for 20 or 30 years, but it's uncommon. And so um, even, you know, even looking at primary residences, people generally move every five to seven years. And so will you hold this property for 20 or 30 years? If the answer is absolutely, there's no doubt about it, I would put more weight into getting some kind of a fixed rate product than, you know what, this is, this is temporary. Either we're gonna move out of the area or, you know, we're gonna go on to bigger and better things at some point, and this is a, a means to that end. In which case, I, I would fear a three to five year loan less under that under those circumstances. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. So, if you have um, a rental right now and it's your personal, can you transfer it to an LLC? And what would? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you continue? Like, in our situation, what we did was we purchased a home and then we um, used that as our rental now, and we purchased mm -hmm. another home. Okay. Um, could. Plug Can you in. just continue doing that up to eight properties so that you're getting your fixed rate? Um, <laughs> let let me start by it. saying again that I'm not here to give anyone legal advice. Okay. Um, what I would tell you is if you have a, a, an accountant or an attorney that understands, going back to Ron's having relationships, you know, understands what you're trying to accomplish, um, it, it's, not unheard, it's not unheard of for that to happen. However, if you're changing residence every 18 months, that, that's a, the cost of moving is, and just the, the work involved in it would be horrible. But um, you know, to say, I kept my house, I kept the loan, I went to the next one, I, I'm not gonna say that that's unheard of. But like I said, if it becomes a, a business model, that's probably where you're gonna cross no, into the realm of problems. Say, but you can still transfer it to an LLC one day. So you can, I mean, so, you're, you're, there's a lot of things, so you could potentially be performing lender fraud, oh, okay. um, well, that's which, would be, which would be a problem. Uh, if you keep your lender informed of what you're doing, that helps in that situation. Um, because in theory, you could go and buy a house in your personal name, get the 30 year fixed, and then go and do basically a quick claim deed to your LLC, and now it's deeded into an LLC. Um, but you told your lender you're gonna live there for 30 years. So mm -hmm. you've committed fraud. Now your situation is, hey, we lived here. This is what we wanna do. So again, 
Talk to an attorney. Yeah, start with your attorney. <laughs> <laughs> there. Because one, remember, one takeaway is you got no legal advice from either of us tonight. So. None whatsoever. We are not promoting fraud by any means. Um, you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, just uh, you kind of answered on that. Was Can you put the loan in your personal name and then have the title uh, of the house on the LLC? It seems like that's kind of a no. Um, I, I would struggle as to what the reasoning for wanting to do that would be. Um, you know, you, you have an asset that's in the title of Entity A, and you, and you have a liability under the title of, of something B. I, you know, again, so we're, not, we're outside of secondary market loans. You're just dealing with your bank on, on being up front with you. This is what I would like to do. In that case, you would either have, you would have the LLC pledging the assets to secure the loan to you as an individual, which isn't impossible, like I said, as long as you're up front and this is what I'm trying to accomplish. I would talk to my accountant or attorney to say, D does that make sense financially? I, I don't think the bank will tell you, nope, you can't do it, as long as you have some reasonable reason for doing it and it's all um, thought through and put together correctly. And the other thing you don't want to have happen is you don't want the corporate veil pierced. So if you put in, in your, if you get the loan in your personal name and then move it, there could be a piercing of the veil in that situation, as opposed to if you have it in the LLC name and you're just guaranteeing the loan, because you're not guaranteeing the loan either way. Mm -hmm. So, a couple of things for you to think about also that, again, as you sit down with your bank and think about these things, something well maintained versus a fixer upper, obviously they're on different ends of the price spectrum, and one is, is more of a defined commodity, especially in this, in this market. You know, it's well maintained, it, it's desirable, people rent and stay, versus it's a fixer upper. You know, what will a job for market rent is yet to be determined. There isn't a history of it. You know, what happens in often times where a property isn't maybe well maintained is you start tearing stuff out and you find that the stuff under the stuff you tore out needs to be tore out also. And so what you thought could be done for 20,000 turns into 50,000. Um, so I would advise you, if you are awesome at these things, you are a carpenter or you, you build houses as it is, you probably can make that assessment better than if it were me and just simply go in and say, you know, is this a coat of paint or am I going down to the studs and tearing out the wiring. So generally speaking, there's a lot more risk with a fixer upper. So um, having a high degree of certainty in what it's gonna cost is important and it's harder to do the more fixing up it takes. Um, again, well-maintained properties get a higher rent, but they also command a higher price. And so as you go through the cost benefit analysis of, of you know, what, what is a reasonable expectation of a rate of return, you just have to kind of have, you know, I've defined these things for myself. So as I go through it, I'm gonna decide if it makes sense. Um, and then, again, I touched about this, how much will it cost to fix up a fixer-upper? That is a, a huge unknown. You know, if it's strictly, let's be ridiculous, the house was built 10 years ago and just needs some TLC, that's different than the house was built 100 years ago and, and we hope it has good bones under some stuff, but we don't really know until we start tearing it apart. A, lot, a much larger degree of risk in, in those different scenarios. Um, where will these dollars come from? Going back to leverage, if I have a lot of student loans, a huge car payments, and a bunch of credit cards that are maxed out, and I'm a nickel off on my prediction of what it's gonna cost, that makes it much more difficult. The other thing too is if you are asking a bank to say, I want you to give me a loan not only what I'm buying today, but a percentage of the money it's gonna cost to fix this thing up, that's a much more expensive transaction to, en to enter into because there's gonna be a lot more analysis of how certain are we that this is these are reasonable assumptions going into it. Um, and then again, who will complete, complete the repairs? Um, I, and I, when I say I, I think I speak for our industry, I get scared when someone says, I'm gonna do it. Oh, I, I see you work 50 hours a week, yeah, I'll do it. When, when will you do it? In my spare time, oh, okay, when is that? How much will it cost? What is your expertise? Do you, you know, because you're good at painting, does that mean you're good at rewiring a house? And so, you know, not having the either I'm a contractor and I do this all the time, or you know I've already got general contractors lined up and they've already kind of walked through the house with me and given me some some hard and fast estimates. You're going to get a lot more questions as it relates to those properties. Other expenses. These are the things that no one wants to talk about, but they do happen. We don't have a problem with vacancy right now, but it happens. What will happen? You know, if you've got a duplex and you have half of it empty, it's going to be really, really, really hard to break even during the period time that half of it is empty. If you've got a 16 unit and we have one unit empty, that's probably a different matter. Um, likewise, maintenance reserve. You know, it's one thing to say I've got enough money set aside to fix a drippy sink or a leaky toilet. It's another thing to say I've got enough money set aside to fix a roof or put in HVAC equipment. And so, you know, how will you build up that reserve so that you have a cushion to handle those types of things when they happen? 
Uh, large repair has touched upon that. Advertising, I don't think it's hard to get a renter right now just from all the market data out there. But if you go back seven or eight years, finding renters that um, you know are, are ready to move in and write you a check for security deposit and all those things are much more difficult. And so sometimes advertising is important. Um, collection costs, I, I hope if you ever have an investment property that people pay you on the first of the month, each and every month, forever and ever and ever. But if they don't, will you have to get an attorney? Will you have to have the sheriff come and evict someone? Those are all things that aren't on an immediate thing, but something, again, to consider as you go through, is this the right uh, thing, opportunity for me? And then lastly, bad debts, where you know the sheriff did kick him out. I went six months of having someone live in here, and I got no rent at all, and now I have a security deposit that doesn't cover the, play, the fact that the place is trashed. And so I hope none of these things ever happen, but I would encourage you to think about it as you look at a property. What if they do? How will I bridge those gaps, and how will I get through those things? Yes. Is it hard to get funding on those city-owned homes that have all those requirements before you can even get a renter in there? Um, so the city of Janesville has a lot of different programs, and I'm sorry I don't have the details on them, but having talked to, they, they have a department that really handles um, like neighborhood services for if you have a property, rehabilitation, or um, facade improvements, and um, they have a, a down payment assistance program for people trying to get into homes as, as owner occupied. And so I think the city, um, and, and I think communities in Rock County in general do a good job of trying to say, you know, for, for the property, that we would like it to take a step up and be more of an asset to the community that I think there's dollars in many cases out there to help do them. But again, kind of the stuff that I just all said for you to think about are the things they're gonna ask you to think about as well. So as you go through and kind of build your resume for it, um, some of those opportunities exist and, and in cases where it makes sense, I'd, I would encourage you to pursue them. Other things to consider, appropriately priced properties. And, and what I mean by that is this. You know, if I said, boy, I could make a pile of money on a 32-unit apartment, I've got one in mind, but if I don't have the wherewithal to bring that into my, my holdings, well, that's great, but that's a story for another day in the future. And so, you know, going through and just simply saying, how much, how much can I afford based on what I make in my 9-to-5 job or for my other sources of income? What can I afford to really bring in? You know, what's my price range? Um, and then kind of going through the, pro the process of sitting down with the realtor and saying, hey, you know what, if I can bring this many dollars to the table, either through my down payment or what I think I might be able to get from a bank or a credit union, what, what does that buy me? What in this marketplace can I get? And going through and having some of that preliminary discussion of, you know, what is my affordability range? Because as we look ahead a few slides here, it's going to come down to you doing a little self-analysis to say, can I make enough money to make this something that I want to do? Um, <clears throat> Also, after you go ahead and find out you know, what that price is, again, what, what kind of rents will they get? So if Ron, yeah, I sit down with Ron, he says, Dave, you know what? I could probably get you something in the 200, or I go with Ron, I could probably afford $200,000, what will that get me? And he comes back with some properties, and hey, the market rents of these are this, and going through that analysis of, again, is that worth my $200,000 investment? And so, again, am I gonna make enough rent from my uh, tenants to justify my spending $200,000 of my money and someone else's money? And then the other thing, and this is big for me, and I think it is for many banks, don't be an absentee landlord. I, I was just sharing with Ron when I got here, if, if I sit down and talk with someone and they're looking, you know, I'm thinking about buying a property, I like to get in my truck and go look and see what else do they have. I, I like to think, you know, I, I wanna be a good neighbor, and so if, if I have someone that's looking to be in, you know, I'm thinking about buying a ho house and I have these other ones, are they, are they properties that I, you know, I would be proud to put a finance by First Community Bank or whatever bank it happens to be out in the front yard? Um, you know, so having the, you know, either I'm showing you through my resume or through my actions or look at my other properties because I think what you'll find is that, yeah, so, you know, my bank would be proud to put the finance buy sign in the, in the front yard if that were the case. The other thing is um, not only, should your bank care, but you, uh, hopefully the neighbors around there care. You know, they, they, you want to be good neighbors to those folks. And so um, are you going to be able to be close enough to take care of the property? So your neighbors say, hey, you know what? I like the Smiths. They do a nice job of the property next door. And on the flip side, geographically, you want to be close enough to say, are my tenants taking care of my property? You know, every time that I drive by, I want to see that the grass is cut and the place looks maintained and the snow gets shoveled or whatever the process is for that. I want to make sure that I'm a good neighbor and the folks that, I, that I'm having in my home are good neighbors to the people around them as well. Okay, and then here's where the rubber hits the road. Will I make a profit? And if I do, is it enough to say that this is worth my pursuing this further? 
And so um, doing some analysis, you know, what revenues can I earn with this property? What expenses will I incur? And then most importantly, and this goes back to, if I'm looking at multiple properties, how do I assess which is better for me? What's gonna be my rate of return? So revenues, obviously someone paying me rent is a source of revenue, but another thing that people overlook sometimes is, especially the laundry service, I have some folks that say, you know, their laundry machine, you know, coin operated ones turn into a profit center on a property as well. So as you're looking at things, if one has one and one doesn't, um, again, another profit center that doesn't necessarily just amount to people writing me a check for $800 a month or whatever the case may be. Parking, some places charge for it. I think in this marketplace, it's very uncommon to have for that. But on the flip side, is there adequate parking? You know, nobody wants to carry a bag of groceries two blocks through the rain. Is there adequate parking for what I'm looking at? Fees for pets. Are you going to allow pets? If you do, what's the charge? What's the market rate for other places that allow pets? You know, if they're good pets, is that a profit center as well? Or does it ultimately just turn into expense for me? And then other amenities. Again, our marketplace is not one that, like, we have a pool or we have a workout room or we have these common areas where people can do stuff. But if it does, are they in some way, shape, or form able to generate revenue or enhance my rent, my rent collecting ability? Conversely, expenses. Just simply making the, the principal and interest payment on the loan obviously is really, really important to your lender. But some of the other things that go into it, real estate taxes is a considerable expense and something that you definitely want to make sure you budget it for. Uh, property insurance, I would encourage you, whoever you have your car insurance through, your homeowner's insurance, whoever it is, sit down with them. Just say, hey, you know what, I'm thinking about doing this. I spoke with my bank or I spoke with my realtor. I think I'm going to be in this kind of price range. What will it cost to insure this? Because to say a $200,000 rental property will be roughly the same to as insure as it is my house, if it's $200,000, they're probably not because the risks associated with each of those is different. Also, management fees. Um, I was sharing with Ron earlier before we kind of got started. Banks love it when you have a management company. Um, I know Property Revival does handle those types of things, and I'm not here to endorse anyone specifically since we're I don't know where we're being broadcast, but what I'm going to tell you is this. is something I would encourage you to look at because I can tell you if it were me, I really don't want the call in the middle of the night to say something's broke, and I would feel horrible for someone to have to go through that, but I would be trudging around being like, oh my gosh. That's what management companies do. They take care of those things. They collect the rents. They send you the net at the end of the month. They make sure the snow is shoveled and the grass is cut and whatever level of service that you contract them for. So I would encourage you to at least consider it if that's what you're doing. Generally speaking, six to ten percent of rents. I think it probably varies on a variety of factors, but kind of budget for that. And then we don't have many of these uh, homeowners associations. I I can't say the last time I saw one, but something I would certainly ask if you are looking. It's something worth knowing. And then of course the debt service. You know, gee, Dave, I'm looking at a two hundred thousand dollar property. I'd want a hundred fifty thousand dollar loan. And what's the payment on that? So you can at least pencil in a rough idea. So I have an example here of just a quick pro forma financial statement. Be, main, pro forma meaning just kind of an, it's an estimate. It's my best guess. And so um, estimate your rent potential. In this case, I, these are just strictly reasonably made up numbers. So I used a four unit uh, with roughly eight or 850 market rent. I'm assuming it in, that, in the case of gross rents is to just be someone's in all of them 12 months a year. Now out of that, I've taken out some real estate taxes. Um, if you haven't already, whatever county you're looking in, you should be able to go to the county's website and look up the actual property taxes on any property in there. So if you're curious, what's the property taxes on XYZ Street, just look them up and you can pencil them in. Or ask your realtor, they'll figure it out. Or ask your realtor. Um, property insurance, like I said, I'd sit down with my, my insurer of choice. Um, just ask them, this is kind of what I'm thinking about. Throw me a number so you have something to pencil in. Uh, management fee. Um, if you are, you have tons of time and you're really good at doing things, you love working with people, great. If not, I'd at least get an estimate on what would it cost. Um, principal and interest payment, like I said, your bank or can help you with that. Homeowners Association, I left blank on there. Vacancy, I can't stress enough, throw in a number. Now, for the sake of this, I used 5%. That's kind of a generic number. But if I have a single family and I'm saying 5%, what does that mean? You know, realistically, if I have it vacant one month a year, my vacancy is over 10% right there. How long am I likely to keep a renter? Maybe it's five years, maybe it's two years, maybe it's one year, I don't know. But use, don't just say, oh, I used 5%. Try to find something that's reasonable. If you're looking at a 16 unit apartment building, it's different than if you're looking at a duplex. One month empty in a duplex is roughly 5%. So use a number that seems reasonable 
for the type of property you're considering. Gas and electric, big one. Are you going to pay those things or are you going to pass them through to your renters? Another thing, and this will depend on the municipality, what happens if they don't pay? Certain municipalities, if they don't pay, it's your responsibility. It gets put on your property tax bill. Other ones, that liability stays with them. So I would encourage you to find out wherever you're looking, find out whose responsibility is in that case. If it's the rent, if I'm telling you, Ron, you're my renter, you pay your utilities, find out if in that geographic location who's responsible if they don't. Lawn and snow removal, talking about being a good neighbor. How much will it cost to do that? If you're doing it yourself, can you get up in the middle of night when you're supposed to be at work and shovel 10 feet of snow? I don't know. If not, again, property manager, how will you handle this for me? Trash removal. Um, oftentimes, if it's a single family or a duplex, maybe even a four unit, you can just wheel the thing out and the city will pick it up and put it on your property taxes. If it gets over that number, generally speaking, you're going to be calling up a dumpster company like Advanced Disposal or John's Disposal and saying, hey, I need a dumpster. When will you pick it up and how much will it cost? Water and sewer, same thing. Oftentimes, water and sewer are generally not pass throughable to the renters if they don't pay. So, oftentimes, I want to say and tell me if I'm wrong, oftentimes those are paid by the landlord, but not always. And again, who's responsible if they don't get paid? Work through those numbers. The water bill is going to be stuck with you, so you're going to want to get that paid. So, we recommend the landlords pay it and then bill it back and go with that. Um, one thing I like about what Dave's thing here is, this is the way a lender looks at every deal, okay? Real estate investors look at them completely differently, but if you have to use a lender, you gotta have a good sheet like this, showing all your numbers, and put it all together. So that's what's really, really important, is to have your numbers put together. You know, and, and you know, in your performance, if you err to the side of being conservative, so you use 10% vacancy or whatever that number is, and they're gonna be really happy with you, and then you know none of these numbers are gonna happen, we're gonna be perfect, so it'll mm -hmm. be fine. Right. But And the other thing I would tell you with that, talking about putting them together and, and sitting down either real, with your realtor or your accountant or your insurance agent, is put down your, not only what your number is, but where you got it from. So I asked Ron, Ron, is a thousand bucks accurate? I'm glad you asked, I talked to my state farm guy, here's his quote. What about the real estate taxes? I looked up in the county, I printed out the sheet. What about the, the um, management company? Oh, I already sat down with them and just said, hey, you know, I've got a couple properties and they've written me a quote, here it is. So whatever assumptions you've used, if you have the backing up data, if you wanna you say, have your lender say, wow, these guys have done their homework, those are the things you can do to try to get that put into place. And then lastly, and this is where the bank wants to see that there's something left over. But the other thing, if I were you, this, this is important to you as it is to me, and probably more so. My profit motive is in the interest, right? right? Yours is in, I want to go out and live, do better things with my financial life because of it. Is this not a number enough to make it worth my time? And we'll talk a little bit about how you quantify that here in a second. Questions on any of that? Okay, so rate of return. This goes back to, is it worth it? Is it worth my time? Is it worth my blood, sweat, and tears to do this? And so what I would tell you is, uh, return on assets and return on equity. So return on assets, I'm gonna back up a slide here. So we went through all of this and we said, hey, you know, reasonably we think if things work out like we think they will, we're gonna net 7,300 bucks a year. Okay, that's great, but is that good? If I had to invest a million dollars to get that, I would say it's not worth your time. In my example, I said we're gonna invest up in the top there, $250,000, part of it the bank's money and part of it my own. So that 7,300 bucks, divided by the total investment of $250,000, that gives me a 2.9% rate of return. Now, that's assuming you paid cash for the whole thing, which on one hand, if you do that and you have a vacancy, oh well, you don't have a lot of other bills because you have paid cash for it. On the flip side, and Ron talk, talked about this earlier, is you're generally gonna have a down payment. So on this $250,000 investment, you've really got $62,500 up front. That's 25%. So. Will $7,300 of profit on a $62,000 investment be worth my time? And again, I'm rounding these numbers, but that equals about almost a 12% rate of return because again, you're, you've concentrated, if you will, your profit on a, on a smaller number. This is what you put into it, and then the bank is gonna help you with the rest. And so if 2.94 on an all cash, or if on 25% down, 11 and three quarters, yes? 
Oh, well, your 7300 if that's 250 is all cash, you wouldn't have a mortgage then. Correct. Correct. So that 7300 would be more like 20 Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. it would be a bigger number. And so a um, good point there. On the return on equity, obviously you're gonna build equity over time, which is gonna return into hopefully a profit center as well this time. But again, is this 11.7% worth my time? And then here's the thing that I would encourage you to do. If you're looking at multiple properties, this is where if one's a, a three unit and costs 300,000 and one's a single family at 80,000, where you can really compare apples to apples, you go through your own pro forma statement, you go through this analysis here, and say, you know, what is my rate of return? What's my, and what I would encourage you to really look at, and to your point, is the return on equity. What's my return on equity? So you can lay one apple and one orange next to each other and say, which is a better deal for me? Now there's other factors that go into that based on just your own preferences and things, but ultimately, which is gonna look better on my balance sheet in the end? And it gives you an opportunity to compare them. Yes? Right, so again, that goes to my, again, the leverage and really what we're talking about this whole thing. And yes, that's the reason you invest in real estate. If you invest in real estate and say, close your eyes, I have this investment, I mean, treat it like, but it's paid for itself. Now all of a sudden this thing that, in this example, you paid $62,000 for in 30 years, you've gotten more than your $62,000. Who, who knows what you got back in rent, right? but you've gotten well more than you're gonna when you cash it in you're gonna get a lot more than sixty two thousand right. dollars back right. and so you that's again goes back to the plan what's your plan in investing in real estate do i want to get the instant return now or am i looking for the long, the long and, and is it a combination of those things right. so that's what you that's you i talked to some people and they said if you're not pulling a certain percentage profit a month don't even think about it, you know, and I'm like, well, it's no longer the thing, the house and, you know, the property. And right. It, it just goes right back to what, what is your plan and what do you want to do with it? And so this is what I, I would tell you. I, I would say this, you know, if you bought this in the year 2000 and, and hoped that things would turn out well with this being close to zero and wanted to sell in 2010, you would have been very, very disappointed because you, you wanted to sell right as the moment tanked. <laughs> now on the flip side, if you had made 11% for the eight years leading up to it and then kind of took it in the shorts at the end, maybe it didn't work out the way you thought. However, if you have other motivations, you know, oh, my folks downsized and they just needed a place to live and I want to keep them close. So I bought this place and it's essentially, they're paying enough to, to cover the cost of having it, but I, I feel good because they're close or, or your children or whatever. And, and ultimately if things work out, I hope to make a little profit on it. You know, if, if there was those ancillary benefits to you, that, then that's wonderful. What I would tell you though is, and this is gonna be scrutinized at all levels, but it's gonna be more scrutinized. If you come in and talk to your bank and say, I wanna buy an investment that's gonna have zero rate of return, but I, I feel good about it in the end, they're gonna say, if you have a plenty of other sources of revenue where you can go ahead and take that gamble, well, you know, maybe that's your choice. But if, if you need this to work out yeah. for this to make sense, then we're a little bit cautious of that. So if you're like, I. I'm gonna be ridiculous. I'm a surgeon and I make $800,000 a year and I just wanna dabble in something. You know what, you're in a position where you could probably afford to do that. But on the flip side, if you know, we're, we're levered a little bit, we've got a bunch of student loans and credit cards and these other things and, and we wanna take a gamble, that's gonna be a harder case to make if you need to use someone else's money to make it happen. Okay? okay? Yep. Yes? Um, the answer is maybe, and so, you know, if this is, it depends on what it is. If you have a parent plus loan, that number is being dumped into the analysis. If you have a, if your child has a Stafford loan, it's probably not being in. If you took out a home equity loan and you put it into your kid's schooling, that's definitely being looked at. And so I would tell you, it depends on what it is. Generally speaking, if you're a guarantor or a co-signer on it, any bank is going to consider that you're going to make the full payment on it. Now, if you can show, I, 
I've got 60 months of pay stubs that my son has paid his payment on time, you can probably mitigate some of those things. But if you're a guarantor or a co-signer on things, most banks are gonna make the assumption that you're gonna get stuck paying it at some point. So again, if you have the financial cushion to make the payment, oh well, that's fine. But if, it's, if I get stuck making this one time, it's gonna be a serious hardship. That's gonna probably come in and, and create other problems for you. Right. Okay. Other questions on that? So if there are no other questions, I've reached my last slide. If there's questions in general, I'm sure Ron and I would be happy got, to address them for you. I just want to go, and I know we're getting long here, guys, so um, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. Just want to talk about a couple of deals, and if you guys have deals you want to talk about. Um, well, we have, these are what we call off-market deals that are available right now. We've got five, eight units in Janesville. Um, that would be around 2.6 million. Um, we also have a resort um, that we're moving into about a $15 million resort. It's got a net operating income of $2 million. Uh, if it's something you're looking for, we have a crowdfunding opportunity, uh, a little as $10,000. Uh, we have some, we have a group of investors here that we do um, fix and flips and buy and holds together in a group. Um, and it, it's kicking off a pretty good return for people on that. It's about a, it's a five to eight year hold, depending on what you want to do with that. Um, and then there's some other opportunities. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, get a hold of me. We can talk about those things too. So with that being said, it's been a long night, a lot of information. If you guys have any questions, anything else that we can throw at you, yes. Mm -hmm. Is there a benefit to new construction over purchasing something that's existing? So your obvious benefit is if you're buying a new construction property, in theory, your maintenance should be zero for the first five years, in theory, um, versus something that's a little bit more tired. You may have to put some money into it. You're going to have ongoing maintenance issues going on with it. Um, I will tell you right now, it's tough to buy a cash flowing new build duplex right now. It's very hard. If you can pull it out, you, you just look at the numbers. Yeah. Material costs are high. So, I mean, if you're going to do it and, and, and throw it in, for sure. I mean, so that it's, it's looking at the numbers. All right, what does this cost me? So, if you can build it for 150. What can I go buy for 150, and what's our return going to be? You will get more rent out of the new duplex for sure. The, the hard part will be, in Tehran's point, is you know, and again, if, if you're a general contractor, it's another story. But you know, the cost of new construction can easily be 160 to 180 dollars a foot, maybe even more. And, and to get a market rent that'll make that investment work out is tough. But on the flip side, if, if you have the ability to lower that down significantly, that can be different. But on, on the flip side, to find a, a duplex that was built in the 80s might be 100 to 110 dollars a foot to purchase and, and need a little TLC but there's a pretty as a percentage there's a significant difference from the cost of that to the cost of the new construction and so going through and doing that math will be really important to, again regardless of your ability to do it but does it make sense for you in your own financial situation we can just talk rent we, rent would be what you want to figure out if you want what your cost is what the rent is that's how you weigh it out anybody else Remember, there's a lot more food and There is a beverages. lot more food. We've got an exit survey here. Oh, yeah. I'd just like to, Ron, I'll pass it out. Um, also, we'll send, if we have your email address, we'll send the PowerPoint from tonight in a PDF format so you have that. Um, stay a while, ask questions one-on-one. -on -one. We've got the realtors back here. Give a couple got, more. We've got Ron and, and Dave has a team of uh, mortgage Special owners as well that you can talk to. Thank you very much for Getting coming. Getting here, Benny. I hope so. And we'll kind of stop, Ron. You can give any one of us uh, the exit survey when we're done with it. Thanks a lot.